morning, happy Sabbath, and welcome to Secrets Unsealed and Some TV Sabbath School and Worship Hour. We're so glad you decided to join us this morning, and we hope our program today will be a blessing to you. As we emerge from this pandemic, of course, we look forward to gathering together in our local churches again. But until such time, we want you to remember to support your local church with your tithes and offerings. We appreciate the support that you give us, and we hope that we continue to be a blessing to you. God bless. Have a great Sabbath. We want to welcome you to Sabbath School today, and we are so glad to be here. I have with me Pastor Govea, and he is from the, he's a senior pastor of the Fresno Central Seventh-day Adventist Church. And of course, I think you all know Pastor <laughs> Stephen Bohr, who is the speaker, and he's the president of Secrets Unsealed and Some TV. And I'm Jeannie Wheaton, and I'm so blessed to be here today. And we have a really wonderful lesson today. I am very happy to be talking about the Sabbath, and uh, we are going to be covering of the full spectrum of the Sabbath from the beginning, its origins, all the way down to the end of this earth's history and how the Sabbath is going to play a very vital role. So um, let's get into it. Pastor Bohr, if you'd Amen. open uh, uh, with a uh, prayer. Sure. Father in heaven, we come before your awesome throne in the powerful name of Jesus. We need divine aid now as we discuss this very important subject. So we ask for the presence of your Holy Spirit. Give us clarity of thought, give us open hearts, and bless all of those who have tuned in. We ask that you will teach us today how we should walk. And we thank you for hearing our prayer, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay, Pastor Govea, if you would all read right. our memory text yes. for us. So please. Exodus 31, verse 16 says, Wherefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. Thank you. So what we want to look at in Sunday's lesson is the origins of the Sabbath. Now, I came out from a Sunday keeping church. So I came into this church um, from a perspective that was different. And we always thought that the Sabbath was something that was more related to the Jews. And we're going to look at that. Is this really a Jewish Sabbath? Is this really something that God has given specifically to the Jews or does it go back a little bit further? And so we're going to start at Genesis at the beginning and look and see, is this something that um, God has given to humanity or is this something specific to the Jews? And uh, Pastor Boyd, would you uh, share with us Genesis 2? We're going to look at verses 2 and 3. Okay, Genesis 2 verses 2 and 3 reads as follows. And on the seventh day, God ended His work which He had done. And He rested on the seventh day from all His work which He had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it He rested from all His work which God had created and made. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I'm going to read now Exodus 20, uh, verse 11, and we're going to talk about uh, how those two relate. Uh, for in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day, Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So what we're looking at there in Exodus 20, that is from the Ten Commandments, and that is uh, what God gave uh, the Israelites. And what he's doing there is relating that commandment, the fourth commandment, back to Genesis. And so let's take um, Genesis 2. And Pastor Bohr, I know that you have studied this um, more than probably anybody that I know, the origins of the Sabbath and how God created, the, in six days, He created a pattern for us, didn't He? Six days work and rest one. Can you, can you talk about that a little bit for yeah, us? Maybe please? I could just read a statement here from the Spirit of Prophecy. 
uh, which is really, really powerful. Patriarchs and Prophets 111. Like the Sabbath, the week originated at creation and it has been preserved and brought down to us through Bible history. God Himself measured off the first week as a sample for successive weeks to the close of time. Like every other, it consisted of seven literal days. Six days were employed in the work of creation. Upon the seventh, God rested and He then blessed this day mm -hmm. and set it apart as a day of rest for man. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you put an emphasis on then. <laughs> so what you're saying is that uh, he actually blessed the day at the end of the day after he kept it. He, he, he hallowed it. Is that correct? That's what the text says. Also, mm -hmm. Genesis 2 mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the fourth commandment say the same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, in Genesis 2, uh, it says uh, in actually verse 3, then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified be the day because in it he rested from all his work. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So why did he bless and sanctify it? Because he rested. Mm -hmm. And the fourth commandment is even more explicit uh, in Exodus chapter 20. Mm -hmm. uh, let's just uh, read uh, the last uh, verse uh, having to do with the Sabbath. It says in Exodus, whoops, I'm still in Genesis here. Uh, Pastor Goya, could you read that? All right, so verse 11, for in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. He rested, <laughs> therefore he blessed and hallowed it. Mm -hmm. So he rested first, and then at the end of the day, he blessed it yeah. and he hallowed it. Yeah. So how does that work? Now, he, he created Adam and Eve on the sixth day, correct? Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so the very next day was the seventh day, correct? Correct. Okay. So how is it that God would tell man to rest on the next day after he was created? Well, uh, the thing is, in Genesis, it does not say that God commanded Adam and Eve to keep mm -hmm. that first Sabbath mm -hmm. because it wasn't their Sabbath, it was God's Sabbath. Mm -hmm. okay. You see, the first week is what I call God's week because God worked six and God ceased, better translation is God ceased on the seventh day. After God created the week by working six days and ceasing on the seventh, then God took the week and He gave it to man. Mm -hmm. And now He says to man, now you're going to do what I did the first week. Mm -hmm. You're going to work six days and on the seventh day you're going to cease. Mm -hmm. So basically the first week is not man's week. Mm -hmm. That's why God didn't tell man to cease because man couldn't cease. Cease from what? Yeah, he right. had, if he hadn't worked. Hadn't worked. Yeah. And actually that is in line with what the lesson tells us that God is giving a, <coughs> an example to humanity. Mm -hmm. He was not mm -hmm. tired, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So the first right. thing that Adam and Eve see God do is rest on the seventh day. <laughs> right. And, um, and just imagining that special first Sabbath that Adam and Eve are alive mm -hmm. um, with all the creation, a perfect creation. And God is there probably showing them the wonders of creation. And to me, that's the ideal of the Sabbath, mm -hmm. right? Rejoicing in the works that God has made. Right. And we will see later on that this has implications even for redemption. That's right. But right there in Genesis, for, for the fact that God had created, that was such a wonder for, for Adam and Eve to understand who God was, what His work was, and that, you know, the first thing that God wanted to do is to spend time with them mm -hmm. and to have them spend time with him and rejoice in his power and his creation in his love so that's that's an amazing thought that god gave them first thing that god did after he created them was give him a special day for fellowship for love and for rejoicing in the wonders of creation and re in resting too, in mm -hmm. resting and entering into His rest, mm -hmm. isn't that right? Mm -hmm. right. Because he, God was the one that created, He was the one that worked, although we know that God doesn't get tired, uh, but He invited man into that rest, mm -hmm. that first step. In, in other words, man rested with God. Mm -hmm. Yes. yes. Uh, and uh, you know, the fourth commandment actually technically applies to 
Adam and Eve and their descendants mm -hmm. beginning the second week. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because the fourth commandment says work six and rest the seventh, mm -hmm. and they hadn't worked six. Exactly. Yes. So the, the second week is where Adam and Eve are supposed to, and that's the reason why God did not command Adam and Eve to keep that first Sabbath mm -hmm. because okay. it's God's Sabbath. Mm -hmm. God ceased from His work. Mm -hmm. The second week now God, by His example that He gave them the seventh day, now He says to Adam and Eve, okay, uh, I work six, I ceased the seventh, you entered my rest, you saw what we did on Sabbath. Mm -hmm. So now, uh, starting tomorrow, yes, yeah. first day of the week, you're going to work. Mm -hmm. You're going to work six days, and the next Sabbath, you're going to keep it the way you saw us keep it this Sabbath. That's right. So that's a beautiful concept. Yeah, and, and another important idea that comes right there from Genesis first is that this was really, the Sabbath was instituted at creation. That first Sabbath, God rested. It was the rest of God. That's mm -hmm. why throughout Scripture, Sabbath is seen as the Sabbath of God. I gave them my Sabbaths, right? right? So God was establishing something for humanity. Mm -hmm. We come to Mark chapter 2, right. verse 27. Mm -hmm. yes. Yes. And Jesus says that mm -hmm. the Sabbath was made for man. Correct. So the Sabbath was made for humanity mm -hmm. and it was established in the creation week. There's no way that we can say that the Sabbath applies only to an ethnic group or to a nation or to, there's a lot of people that like to say, oh, the Sabbath is just for the Jews. God created it just for the Jews. Well, there were no Jews when God created Adam and Eve, right? Mm -hmm. That's right. Um, Adam and Eve were the first parents of humanity, human parents of right. humanity. So it's really for all humanity. All human beings are blessed with this gift that also became a commandment, right? Mm -hmm. So um, everyone who wants to accept this gift and who wants to be obedient to this commandment will be blessed because God Absolutely. gave it for everybody. So God's law, even though it wasn't, they didn't have the Ten Commandments in Eden, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, they didn't have the law written they knew the law. In mm -hmm. fact, the law was written in their heart. Yes. They right. were perfect. They had not sinned yet. Mm -hmm. So they didn't need the law written on stone, mm -hmm. tablets of stone. Right. Isn't that exactly. correct? Yeah. So, so Adam and Eve knew what the law was. They knew, knew not just the Sabbath commandment. They knew all the other commandments too. They sure. knew, you know, that they were to stay together, the two of them. Mm -hmm. Of course, there were only two of them initially, but they, they knew that God was to be their only God. And they knew um, they knew, of course, not to go outside the bounds of what was natural to them, correct? Mm -hmm. That was right. in their in their nature uh, yes. because they had that was the unfallen nature. Mm -hmm. But it, then it was after sin when God needed to remind us what His law was, right. uh, mm -hmm. which which is, of course, we know that God's law is the transcript of His character, um, the you know something that tells us how to live, how to love God, and how to love man. So it's a it's a law of love. Uh, yes. And, but God had to give it to us to give it to the Israelites um, uh, so that they would understand um, how to stay within the bounds of of mm -hmm. correct relationship with Him and with each other. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, it's interesting uh, that the, the situation of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden is similar to what God wants for us. Mm -hmm. You know, in a couple of lessons, we're going to study the everlasting covenant. Mm -hmm. And um, we're told in Jeremiah 31 that God is going to write His law on our minds and on our hearts. Right. And then we'll naturally do what the law requires. Amen. And yes. so with the heavenly beings, as well as with Adam and Eve, right after the creation, the law of God was written in their hearts and in their minds. Mm -hmm. You know, they didn't have to think, well, you know, should I commit adultery or not? <laughs> yeah. Of course, they couldn't commit adultery because there was only two of them. Yeah. Oh, spiritual adultery, right. maybe. Or, you know, Eve didn't think, well, you know, taking the fruit, that'd be stealing, wouldn't it? You know, the law was written in her heart. Mm -hmm. But when they disobeyed, then uh, the law became a burden, became an obligation until they understood that there was a redeemer mm -hmm. that was going to redeem them from sin. Yeah. Right, and that's another, we're going to talk about that and how that relates to the Sabbath. But understand that all of these things, all of these laws, we're talking about the Sabbath specifically today, these are all things given to us by a God of love, a God mm -hmm. that wants us to be in right relationship with Him. Eventually, He's going to totally uh, transform us, um, if not here on this earth eventually, but into His image. 
image. And that's, that's the original plan uh, that we were created in his image, and he wants to bring us back. And the Sabbath is one tool that he uses mm -hmm. for us, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more. We're going to go forward a little bit to Exodus 5, and um, we're going to see now... God had sent Moses at this point. He had, uh, the Israelites had been captive in Egypt and it had been hundreds of years and they had forgotten. Now this is generations of people that had been born and they were in Egypt and they had learned the Egyptian ways and they had forgotten about God and God wanted to rescue them, deliver them. And so he sent Moses to Pharaoh, who's the king of uh, Egypt. Mm -hmm. And let's read, Pastor Govea, would you yes. read uh, Exodus 5, verses 4 and 5 for us? Yes, it says, Then the king of Egypt said to them, Moses and Aaron, why do you take the people from their work? Get back to your labor. And Pharaoh said, Look, the people of the land are many now, and you make them rest from their labor. <laughs> so it's interesting that in Patriarchs and Prophets by Ellen White, uh, page 258, she comments on this, very interesting. She says, in their bondage, the Israelites had to some extent lost the knowledge of God's law and they had departed from its precepts. The Sabbath had been generally disregarded and the exactions of their taskmasters made its observance apparently impossible. Mm. But Moses had shown his people that obedience to God was the first condition of deliverance. And the efforts made to restore the observance of the Sabbath had come to the notice of their oppressors. So this is why uh, the Pharaoh was angry, mm -hmm. okay? Because uh, Moses had come down and he had taught the people, we need to get back to God. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways that we're going to do that is we're going to start keeping this Sabbath that you probably haven't heard of before mm -hmm. because you grew up in Egypt. And um, so we, we need to take you back to God's law. Um, and, and then in, in the appendix in Patriarchs and Prophets, just a little bit more, the Israelites were delivered uh, that they might observe the statutes of the Lord, including the fourth commandment. And this placed upon them an additional obligation to keep the Sabbath strictly as well as to keep all his commandments. So God was trying to bring them back. He wanted to bring them back so that they had a knowledge of who he was, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so they understood, oh, our, the way we're going to live our lives is going to be different now mm -hmm. when God delivers us. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. So we're going to move on to the next um, day's lesson, and that is we're going to be talking about uh, Exodus 16 mm -hmm. and the manna episode. Yes. And this is just, this story is, you know, just full of um, insight into, into God's ways. And it, it's, it's, it's a, there's tremendous lessons that we can learn uh, from, from Exodus 16. So we're going to read, um, Pastor Govia, why don't you read for us uh, Exodus uh, 16, and we're going to read the first six verses. All right. Mm -hmm. It says, And they journeyed from Elim, and all the congregation of the children of Israel came to the wilderness, wilderness of Sin which is between Elim and Sinai on the 15th day of the second month after they departed from the land of Egypt. Then the whole congregation of the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said to them, Oh, that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt. When we sat by the pots of meat and when we ate bread to the full, for you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain quota every day, that I may test them, whether they will walk in my law or not. And it shall be on the sixth day that they shall prepare what they bring in, and it shall be twice as much as they gather daily. Then Moses and Aaron said to all the children of Israel, At evening you shall know that the Lord has brought you out of the land of Egypt. Okay. 
Okay, and then I'm going to jump over to, to verse 27, and it says, Now it happened that some of the people went out on the seventh day to gather, but they found none. Mm -hmm. And the Lord said to Moses, How long do you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? See, for the Lord has given you the Sabbath. Therefore, he gives you on the sixth day bread for two days. Mm -hmm. um, let every man remain in his place. Let no man go out of his place on the seventh day. Mm -hmm. So the people rested the seventh day. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of lessons lessons we can learn from this, aren't there? Many, many. Many, many. I mean, one of them is the, the, it's kind of a no-brainer. You know, God wants to show mm -hmm. His people that He's going to provide for them, mm -hmm. uh, that they, they could stop grumbling, that He wasn't planning on taking them out there to kill them, mm -hmm. to starve them to death, but mm -hmm. He was going to provide for them. But we see some other lessons. Pastor Bohr, what, mm -hmm. what, do we, what can you share with us? Well, the interesting thing is God was teaching them that they did not have to work on Sabbath in order to earn a living. <laughs> <laughs> Very clearly. Yeah. Right. You know, because they were supposed to cease on the seventh day and God was going to provide for their food and for the, what mm -hmm. they needed. Mm -hmm. Right. But, you know, many years uh, in Sabbath school and at home, my parents and my teachers taught me that the purpose of the Exodus 16 episode was to teach us to keep the Sabbath, mm -hmm. you know, because uh, manna did not fall on the Sabbath. So that means you're supposed to keep the Sabbath. Which is true. Which is absolutely true. <laughs> but I never heard the reason why mm -hmm. the manna episode taught, taught us to keep the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. I never understood the Christ-centered reason mm -hmm. for it. Mm -hmm. You know, when you look at the story, mm -hmm. it says that if the people picked up the manna any day other than Friday for Sabbath, Two characteristics took place. Mm -hmm. One, it bred worms, and second, it stank. Mm -hmm. Now, what is it that breeds worms and stinks? Mm -hmm. It is decomposing flesh, mm -hmm. right? But when it was picked up on Friday and saved for Sabbath, it was as fresh on Sabbath as it had been on Friday. Mm -hmm. So what did God want to teach through this? Mm -hmm. You know, the, we're told that everything in the writings of Moses uh, is Christ-centered. Mm -hmm. Everything points to Jesus. Mm -hmm. So then uh, I went to um, John chapter 1, uh, chapter 6 and verse 51, where Jesus says, I am the living bread that came from heaven. I'm the manna. And he says, the manna is my flesh, mm -hmm. which I will give for the life of the world. Mm -hmm. So the manna represented the flesh of Jesus. Mm -hmm. So I got to thinking, you know, what day did Jesus die? He died on Friday, right. the sixth day. Mm -hmm. And he was the manna. Mm -hmm. What happened to his flesh on Sabbath? Mm -hmm. What would have happened with normal flesh? It would, it would have begun to decompose. Yes. But the flesh of Jesus as he rested in the tomb was as fresh on Sabbath as it had been on Friday. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the purpose of the man episode was to teach we're supposed to keep the Sabbath in commemoration of the rest of Jesus mm -hmm. in the tomb where he mm -hmm. flesh, his flesh saw no corruption. Mm -hmm. So the Sabbath is a sign of creation and it is also a sign of resting in redemption. And it's interesting that in Luke 23, it says that while Jesus was resting inside, mm -hmm. the woman, and of course we understand the disciples mm -hmm. as well, rested the Sabbath day mm -hmm. according mm -hmm. to the commandment. Command. Now they didn't understand why they were resting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they were sad and you know, they had yes. teary eyed and they were full of anxiety and everything. What if they had paid attention to what Jesus said? Mm -hmm. You know, I'm going to Jerusalem, I'm going to be mistreated, I'm going to die, and I'm going to resurrect the third day. What would that Sabbath have been like? They mm -hmm. would have said, the Master is resting in the tomb on the Sabbath like He did at creation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and we are resting with Him mm -hmm. in His rest from mm -hmm. His redemptive works. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and tomorrow He's going to mm -hmm. be raised again to begin his work mm -hmm. uh, once again of, um, of redemption. Mm -hmm. right. And it would have been totally different for them if they just listened to Jesus that he was going to die, be buried, and resurrect. Mm -hmm. So let, let's look at that passage real quick in, in Luke 23. Um, we're going to look at verses 54 um, through 24 too. Um, do you want to read that, Pastor Govea? That's, right, that's so Luke 23, 23 verses 54 through 24 too. Uh, Luke 23, mm -hmm. 54 through, 54 mm -hmm. through. 24 too. Uh, okay. All right. Having arrested him, they led him and brought him to the high priest's house 
Am I correct? This, this is no, 20, I'm, 23, 23. This is 23. Plus 54. Okay, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. All right. No okay. problem. 54. Uh, 54. There you go. That day was the preparation and the Sabbath drew near. So that was Friday. All right. The prepar day, right. Preparation. Right. Day. Preparation. Right. And that we learned that in Exodus 16, too, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So it says, And the women who had come with him from Galilee followed after. And they observed the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and fragrant oils. And they rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. Now, chapter 24, verses 1 and 2. Mm -hmm. Now, on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Thank you. So that was, it's clear then that Jesus rested when he was in the tomb on the Sabbath day. Now, a lot of, of course, the Sunday churches use this as a, the, the resurrection as um, a reason for worshiping on Sunday, right? Mm -hmm. And, uh, but there, there's no scriptural evidence for that. Well, actually, yeah. there's scriptural evidence mm -hmm. that the resurrection of Christ on, this, on Sunday validates rest on Saturday. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Right? <laughs> Absolutely. The argument right. that is used That's great. by most yeah. denominations to yeah. say we worship on Sunday and we go to church on Sunday because Jesus was raised from the dead on Sunday. Well, Jesus started to work again on Sunday, the first day of the week. Actually, the Bible always calls it the first day of the week, not mm -hmm. Sunday, right? Or not Sunday or day of the Lord calls it uh, first day of the week. Right. And that first day, Jesus started to work again for our salvation. He did a lot of things on that first day. He appeared to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. So when people tell me, you know, I, I go to church on Sunday and rest on Sunday because Jesus was raised from the dead on Sunday, so that's actually the reason why you should keep Saturday or Sabbath that's day, great. seventh day. Because, mm -hmm. see, in Scripture, you have this unity between the Old and the New Testament. And you have this unity between the character of God in the Old Testament and the character of God in the New Testament. Actually, Jesus said uh, to the Jews, before Abraham was, I am. Mm -hmm. So Jesus was the great I am that appeared to Moses in the burning bush, right? God appeared through the angel of the Lord. And we know that that angel of the Lord was God also because it's there very clearly stated. Right. So Christ who wrote the law or who gave the law to Moses. Right. Christ who created the world. We, right. are, we are told that he, the one. word was mm -hmm. created mm -hmm. through the word, right? Yes. So he that rested on the seventh day when he created us, he rested on the seventh day when he saved us. Right. So there's this clear unity Absolutely. between the Old Testament and the New Testament and between what the Old Testament reveals about the character of Christ Mm -hmm. The Bible says in Malachi, I, the Lord, do not change. Right. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8, we read, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Yes. Meaning that Jesus does not change. He would not change a law that is so important as the Sabbath established at creation without telling us so. That's right. And he never said it, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> he actually showed by his example, keeping the Sabbath throughout his human life, mm -hmm. and his example when he created us and when he died for us to save us, he showed us that the Sabbath is a very powerful sign between God and his people. Very good, very good. It's not a coincidence that in Genesis, we're told in Genesis 2 verse 1, uh, Thus all the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. Mm. Mm -hmm. Talking about the sixth day. Yeah. Right. What comes immediately after? The Sabbath. Sabbath. The Sabbath day. Mm -hmm. What did Jesus say on the cross the sixth day? It is finished. It is finished. Mm -hmm. And what did he do the next day? And he rested. He rested. He rested. He rested. Why did Jesus resurrect Sunday? Well, because he had to rest in the tomb on Sabbath. Mm -hmm. Yes. Sunday is not the important day. Yeah. Exactly. It's the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Because Jesus did in redemption, what he did at creation. Mm -hmm. And it's no coincidence that when you go to Revelation chapter 21 and 22, immediately after saying, I make a new heavens and a new earth, he says, it is finished. Wow. Mm -hmm. And then Isaiah 66 yes. says that we will keep the Sabbath. Yes. Amen. So the Sabbath is a sign of creation, redemption, mm -hmm. and the future restoration. Yes. Uh, Sunday does not fit anywhere mm -hmm. in Absolutely. this scenario. It's exactly. a human creation exactly. based on human tradition. You know, it's interesting that, uh, that the uh, last three popes uh, have said 
that, um, you know, Sabbath has been replaced by Sunday in commemoration of creation. Mm -hmm. That's not a possibility. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the reason is this. On 9-11, every year, the 3,000 names of those who perished in the World Trade Center are read there in New York. Uh -huh. Why uh, don't they read the names on September 12th? <laughs> because that's not when it happened. That's right. It's rooted in history. You can only celebrate it when it originally took place. Mm -hmm. The same is true. God rested on the seventh day. You cannot commemorate creation on the first day because the first day is not the day in which God rested. Right. It's so simple. But Christians, you know, unfortunately, they listen to the religious leaders that say, don't worry about those Adventists, you know, they're, they're uh, uh, wrong, you know, we're in the majority. How many people really keep the Sabbath? They use all kinds of human arguments mm -hmm, mm -hmm. when it would be beautiful just to, just to uh, obey what God says mm -hmm. in His Word. Right. The Sabbath is such a blessing. It is Ceasing. A blessing. You know, does it really make sense to rest on Sunday? the first day of the week. No, it's, it makes more sense to work the first six days and then rest on the seventh. Mm -hmm. And for those of us who used to keep, keep Sunday, it, it's not a day, it wasn't a day of rest. Mm -hmm. of course. And in fact, we're going to talk about so, uh, covenant sign, mm -hmm. which is something else that we see in, in the Sabbath. But when I became an Adventist, it, it was, of course, um, a bit of a, I had to, I had to give up things. So, mm -hmm. so it was, there was some sacrifice in it. I, you know, my family didn't like it. My mother certainly was mm -hmm. against it. Mm -hmm. And I had to give up my friends. I was raised in an Armenian church and I mm -hmm. had to, you know, walk away from that. Um, but I knew that what I had, what God had shown me, um, I knew that this was something that I had to do because God said it. I was totally convinced that this was biblical, whereas the Sunday was not. We'd go, you know, we'd go to church on Sunday morning, and then the rest of the day we do whatever we want. We mm -hmm. go shopping, and mm -hmm. but it wasn't a day of rest. Right. And um, only, mm -hmm. you know, when I when I became a true Seventh, seventh Day Sabbath keeper, did I understand what that true rest was. I mean, I was nervous because I was a student uh, in college, and this was like 42 years ago, and I <laughs> I, uh, I was studying, and I was worried that my grades were going to fail, but you know what? My grades really got better uh, because I didn't study on the Sabbath and I, um, that was one indication that God was uh, really blessing me mm -hmm. and I, I got, you know, really top of the, the line uh, um, grades, grades and God blessed me. Amen. But this was also a sign. Um, this was, a, keeping the Sabbath was a sign for me, uh, for other people. They could see, okay, she's different now. Mm -hmm. So the Sabbath uh, being a sign is very important. Mm -hmm. Why? I, yes, go ahead. Can I just mm -hmm. read a statement from Patriarchs and Prophets? Absolutely. About sure. the meaning of the original Sabbath in the Garden of mm -hmm. Eden, why God established it. You know, people think, Oh, on Sabbath, I can't do anything. <laughs> it's such a burden. It's so difficult. Ellen White wrote in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 47, after resting upon the seventh day, God sanctified it or set it apart as a day of rest for man. Now listen why. Following the example of the Creator, man was to rest upon this sacred day that as he should look upon the heavens and the earth, he might reflect upon God's great work of creation and that as he should behold the evidences of God's wisdom and goodness, his heart might be filled with love and reverence for his maker. Mm. That's what the Sabbath is all about, mm -hmm. remembering how wonderful God is yes. mm -hmm. and spending all day just with him. Mm -hmm. Right, right. And remembering what he has done and all of his bounty for blessings that he has given us. Um, but what about this idea of a sign? Um, we look, um, Pastor Govea, do you want to read uh, on Tuesday's lesson the uh, yes. verse? Mm -hmm. Yes. So it's uh, Exodus 31 you verses. You can read 13 if you want from 13 to 17. Okay, so like let's do okay. that. I actually love this passage and I think it's so meaningful. Sometimes we think, well, this was for the Jews, but actually if you study scripture as a whole, you see the principles that are here laid out. Mm -hmm. And one thing that I like to underline when I talk about this passage is the fact that if you read Exodus 31 verse 18, which is the last verse in this chapter, you immediately are taken into the context, which is the giving of the Ten Commandments as a law written by the finger of God to Moses. Mm -hmm. God was putting the Ten Commandments in Moses' hands. Mm -hmm. Look at verse 18, it says, And when he had made an end of speaking with him on Mount Sinai, 
he gave Moses two tablets of the testimony, tablets of stone written with the finger of God. So it's right there, the moment that God is putting the Ten Commandments in the hand of Moses, he talks about one commandment. Mm. He could have talked about any of the ten, right? Mm -hmm. But there's one that he underlines before putting the tablets in, in Moses' hand. That's good. Verse 12, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak also to the children of Israel, saying, Surely my Sabbaths you shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. You shall keep the Sabbath, therefore, for it is holy to you. Everyone who profanes it shall surely be put to death. That was a death penalty from breaking the Sabbath. For whoever does any work on it, that person shall be cut off from among his people. Work shall be done for six days. But the seventh is the Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. Therefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations as a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. Now, the interesting thing is that God not only says, hey, I'm giving you ten commandments, but don't forget the Sabbath, okay? No. He actually goes over the principles of the commandment again, mm -hmm. and he says, this is really important. Right. You know? So there's, there, it's so hard to understand how biblical believers can just throw the Sabbath mm -hmm. out the window. <laughs> now, so why do you think he picked the fourth commandment as a sign? Why didn't he pick, you know, the second commandment as a sign or the first commandment as a sign? Why, why was it the Sabbath? Why was it the fourth commandment? Well, first of all, I like to think that there is no visible reason for keeping the Sabbath. Mm. And we worship an invisible God for us as human beings. We are saved by faith. And faith is to stay, stand firm like Moses, seeing him who is invisible. Mm -hmm. Now, we look at the, you know, all the other times, the year, or the, the earth, there's a scientific reason for the year right? Mm -hmm. The earth goes around the sun. There are scientific reasons for the month because mm -hmm. they were seen because of the moon and the stage of the moon. And, you know, the day, the earth goes around itself. How can you justify a cycle of seven days? Mm -hmm. There's nothing in the natural world that mm -hmm. will tell you that you have to stop every seventh day. Right. But there is a clear word from God. And if you express faith in that word, mm -hmm. then you are saved by Christ, right? Mm -hmm. So I do believe that the Sabbath is a sign so strong, first and foremost, because you, you keep it just because God said so. There's no other reason to mm -hmm. keep it. Mm -hmm. God said so, right? Right, and weren't they, the Israelites were to be a light, correct? Mm -hmm. And so if other people, just like when I became an Adventist, people could see I was doing something different by the way that I was going to church and I wasn't involved in any secular activity. So people could see these Israelites, uh, we're not going to go to Jerusalem and buy veggie burgers on the Sabbath because they're not going to sell them on the Sabbath. Um, so they, 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 they knew that they were doing things differently mm -hmm. and, they, and that, that directly connected them with the God of heaven. Mm -hmm. So they were, they were different and God wanted them to be different because different was good. And that's what, uh, you know, they wanted, that was reflecting God. God and what he, his purpose for them in remembering creation. And we're going to talk about redemption a mm -hmm. little bit. Um, so, so this, that as a sign to other people, not only that relationship between God and the Israelites, but they could also affect those that were around them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, if God had made a shrine mm -hmm. where everybody had to come to the shrine to mm -hmm. remember that he was a creator, mm -hmm. in other words, a sign in, in space, if you please, mm -hmm. 
well, the people who live close would have an advantage. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. But you see, the Sabbath comes to us. Yes. <laughs> we don't come to the Sabbath. And that's perfect. You know, exactly. I'm, do I'm doing prison ministry now, and I'm um, sending materials to the prisoners. And the prisoners in prison in their little jail cells can worship God on the Sabbath day Amen. because that's that's a time that that, that they can set apart in, in their in their own little uh, life there. Wherever you are, it's going to come every seven days. Every Amen. Se yeah. Amen. yeah. Even in the North Pole. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> so what else does it, um, do we want to share about this, uh, uh, the covenant sign? Mm -hmm. um, is there anything else that you'd like to share? Um, yeah. um, mm -hmm. The lesson points out that the Sabbath was actually already in, at creation, mm -hmm. an invitation to rest in God, right? right? Mm -hmm. They were looking unto the example of God resting on the Sabbath day, and God was inviting them to partake of his rest, yes. even before sin. Yes. And of course, after sin, the Sabbath takes on this whole new dimension of a celebration of grace in redemption. Mm -hmm. Because as Jesus rested in the tomb after he paid for our sins on the Sabbath day, when I worship God and rest on the Sabbath day, I'm worshiping him not only as my creator who created all things in the beginning, but my Savior, right. who did for me what I could not do for myself. Mm -hmm. He lived an absolutely perfect life from birth to death. Yes. Now, I do believe that when we accept Christ, we become new creatures. He gives us power to walk in newness of life, like mm -hmm. the Apostle Paul said. In the New Covenant, he writes the law of God in our hearts through the Holy Spirit. But let us be honest, there's no human being besides Christ that never committed any sin. Right. So we were all condemned to die eternally. Mm -hmm. So in, Jesus lived that perfect life and offered it for, a, as a sacrifice to God on that cross. He rested then on that Sabbath day and that was a seal also mm -hmm. of his victory. Right. and of his salvation. Mm -hmm. So when I'm resting on the Sabbath day now, it's even more meaningful because mm -hmm. I'm worshiping a God that not only is super all-powerful, created me, and he's filled with majesty up in heaven, but a God that came down, lived a perfect life for me, mm -hmm. died for me, mm -hmm. and rested on that tomb mm -hmm. on the seventh day. Yes. So that takes on a whole new meaning. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I, I'd like to, for us to go to Hebrews 4, if we mm -hmm. could, yes. um, uh, verses one, uh, 1 through 4, if yes. somebody wants to read that. And then I'd like to read uh, what the Bible commentary has to say about that. Okay. I thought it was uh, important. I'll have it here. Okay. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear, lest any of you seem to have come short of it. For indeed, the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. But the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. So stop. we'll stop there for a second. So we're talking about the Israelites. Yes. That they um, they had made the law into something that was le legalism. Mm, yes, and it wasn't by mixed with faith. It's yes. with it. so they didn't so, enter into history. And it's interesting to see that the problem was not with the law. Mm. The law had no problem, mm -hmm. but the way they were trying to live it or to obey it or mm -hmm. the way they interpreted it was not what sh they should have done because mm. they were not mixing it with faith. Right. 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 Not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. For we who have believed do enter that rest. So it is more than just a literal rest. Right. The Sabbath day yes. has something more to do than just physically abstaining from work. Mm -hmm. There's a spiritual component. Mm -hmm. We do enter that rest. We who have believed, as he has said, so I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my, ra my rest. Although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. Okay, good. <laughs> so um, according to the Seventh Bible Commentary 418, it says the rest into which Christians, including converted Jews, mm -hmm. enter is the very same spiritual rest yes. into which God had invited ancient Israel to enter. Mm -hmm. The rest of soul that comes with full surrender to Christ. Mm -hmm. 
and with the integration of the life into the eternal purpose of God. Yes. I really like that. Yes. Amen. Um, because that's, you know, that's the core of it, that mm -hmm. when we enter into the, His rest, we know that he is, our, he is not only our Creator, He is our Redeemer. Amen. And He's the one that's going to recreate all things yes. at the yes. end of time. Yes. So I think um, looking at our time, we're going to move um, to Wednesday's lesson mm -hmm. and uh, jump right into, it's called the sign of sanctification. Pastor Boy, would you read uh, the Exodus 31, 13, if you would? I, okay, okay 31, 13 mm -hmm. says, Speak also to the children of Israel, saying, Surely my Sabbaths you shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you." Mm -hmm. So the lesson brings out two concepts, mm -hmm. and one of them we're going to skim over a little bit. Mm -hmm. It's a sign of knowledge, mm -hmm. and um, that God wants us to know Him yes. in an intimate way. Yes. And it equates uh, knowledge with some, some wonderful verses that you could look up, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, knowledge and uh, serving Him, to fear Him, to mm -hmm. believe Him, to mm -hmm. trust Him, seek Him, to call on His name. So we have a God that loves us so much, He wants to have a close relationship mm -hmm. with us, mm -hmm. and um, that is part of this uh, sign of sanctification, mm -hmm. but sanctification is an important co concept that I think mm -hmm. it's a big word. <laughs> Pastor Bohr, what, uh, can you tell us a little about sanctification? When God sanctified or so made something holy, He separated it from what was common. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The six days of the week are common days. Right. They're work days. They're secular days, we might say. Mm -hmm. But the seventh day is a sacred day. And right. as Israel kept the Sabbath because they love the Lord, mm -hmm the nations would see that they were a holy people and that God had separated them as a holy and special people. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the Sabbath in that sense was a sign that Israel was God's chosen people and, uh, and it announced it to all the surrounding nations that they serve the true God. Mm -hmm. And Ezekiel 20 brings that out. Uh, you know, if we could yeah. read Ezekiel chapter 20 mm -hmm. uh, in verse 12 I and then right verse here. 20. Go ahead. It says, Moreover, I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between them and me that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. Mm -hmm. And in verse 20, Hallow my Sabbaths and they will be a sign between me and you that you may know that I am mm -hmm. the Lord your God. So, so it's, uh, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. I like the fact that mm -hmm. these two notions are really interconnected. You cannot know the God that you are worshiping in mm -hmm. if you do not know that He is your Creator. Mm -hmm. And the way to really recognize Him as Creator is by observing the Sabbath day. Mm -hmm. So when you throw away the true Sabbath, you throw away the knowledge that you can have of this God and sanctification is really the work of God in you Absolutely. through a relationship of love. Right. If you don't know who this God is, what He likes, what He dislikes, how are you going to let Him sanctify you? That's right? right. So sanctification is this process that right. happens in your relationship with God as you know more about Him and you allow Him more into your life and you allow His grace and His Spirit to mold you into the divine image of Christ. That is something that happens in a very intimate relationship. That's right. So when I read, sanctify my Sabbath so that you, so you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you, that tells me that to really know God, mm -hmm. you need to enter into this Sabbath rest. Yes. That as we have seen, is more than literal rest. It is literal rest but it is also a spiritual rest given to us by God, mm -hmm. by the grace of God, instituted at creation, right there sealed with the death of Christ. And we are even told that in the new creation, in the new earth, we will also worship God on the Sabbath. Yes, yeah, so this is the work of God, right? This is, right. This is the work of God. This mm -hmm. isn't something that we do, we mm -hmm. become, sanctify ourselves. Uh, uh, so we, we have to remember that. This is something that God does mm -hmm. and we cooperate with it, mm -hmm. correct? Yes. Uh, because if you go back to Leviticus, that's where God says, be holy as I am holy. Mm -hmm. Well, if you find the context of that is, uh, 
you know, abstaining from uh, flesh foods, and it's it's keeping the ceremonial laws, and it's um, not worshiping Im, um, uh, idols. Uh, but he says, "Be holy." So, but but God God is the one. He wants us to cooperate with Him. Amen. In other words, He's bringing us out of Egypt, like He did uh, the 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 Israelites. Mm -hmm. He's bringing us out of our worldly life, if we've lived a worldly life. He He wants to get Egypt out of us, right? <laughs> yeah. And uh, He not only wants us to get out of Egypt, He wants to get Egypt out of us. Mm -hmm. And he wants his image to be recreated in us. But this is his work. It's yes. not our work. Mm -hmm. It says in uh, Philippians, uh, I think it's 2.13, for it's God which works in us both mm -hmm. to will and to do mm -hmm. his good pleasure. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, Colossians 1.27, mm -hmm. uh, it's Christ in you, the mm -hmm. hope of glory. Yeah. It's not us. It's not us that can change, mm -hmm. but it's the power of Christ working in our lives. And by keeping the Sabbath, it keeps our focus. It keeps, mm -hmm. it keeps us um, looking to God. Um, um, to do the work in us and to, to have that wonderful relationship mm -hmm. um, between the two of us and um, that only God can bring. Mm -hmm. What else would you like to share, Pastor Borne? Well, we have to go on to Thursday's yes, lesson we do. because the yeah. time is yeah. just about up. We have one minute left. Yeah, so, so <laughs> it's remembering the Sabbath day is, um, it just brings out about going backward. Mm -hmm. um, Pastor Borne, do you want to share about that, about remembering? It's mm -hmm. the only commandment. Mm -hmm that begins with the word remember. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. Now remember can mean two things. It can mean remember something of the past mm -hmm. or going on from now, mm -hmm. remember every week mm -hmm. uh, to commemorate creation. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think it's significant that God says, remember the Sabbath day mm -hmm. to keep it holy. Mm -hmm. Because I, as we observe the Sabbath, we're not only concluding the previous work, we're actually introducing the following week. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I think it's important that the commandment begins by saying, remember, mm -hmm. when so many people yes. have forgotten. Absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely key. And of course, we, we know that in the end time, we're not going to cover Friday, but we know that uh, the Sabbath is going to uh, play an important part in, in prophecy uh, mm -hmm. being fulfilled. Pastor Govea, will you have a, a prayer for us? Okay, let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you so much for giving us your Sabbath day so we can rest in Christ, so that we can remember that he is our creator, he is our savior, and he is also our coming king. Amen. We thank you for this wonderful gift, and we pray that you may teach us how to live every Sabbath for your glory. In the name of Jesus, amen. 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 Our opening song this morning Tell me the story of Jesus. Despise and the 
Good morning and happy Sabbath, dear friends. I'm so happy that you decided to join us for our Secrets Unsealed worship service today. Before we enter the worship service, we do want to ask the Lord's blessing. So please bow your heads with me as we ask the Lord's blessing upon all of the worship service program. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the privilege now of opening your holy word, hearing special music, and reading from your word. We ask that your Holy Spirit will be with us, that everyone who watches will be inspired by your word and by the music. This we pray in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Today's story is the prodigal son. Jesus called all the people to listen to him. But meanwhile, some would mutter. They would say, look at this man. He's supposed to be so good, but he goes and eats with, wick with wicked people. And he goes with people that are not good, he would say. They would say. You could see the men here chatting along. Good people don't need to, for me to help them, Jesus said. Bad people do. Then he told a story of a shepherd that has a hundred sheep and one goes missing. He goes looking for the one that's missing. And then when he's found, he calls his friends and says, isn't it wonderful that I found the lost sheep? You can see the shepherd there when he finds his lost sheep. If a woman has 10 pieces of money and he loses one, she won't think about the other nine. She spends her time looking for the one lost coin. It's like that with God our Father. When one ma man is bad and sorry for his wicked things he's done, all the angels rejoice in heaven. It's more important to them than counting the people who have been good all of their lives. And you can see this man praying and repenting. Then Jesus told another story about a man who had two sons. He loved them both and he gave each of them half of everything that he had. He loved his son so much. The elder son stayed at home and helped his father. And the younger son took everything his father had given him. And off he went to a distant country. And he spent all the money that his dad had given him. And before long, no money left. He had to get a job looking after pigs. And he was so hungry that he even ate what the pigs left over. He was starving. And you can see there, he's looking after the pigs for his job. Then he thought, even the servants in my father's house live better than this. I'm going to be back home. I won't ask him to, to look after me like a son. I don't deserve that. Maybe I can work with him as a servant instead. And so when he went home, his father saw him coming from a long way off. Oh, he was so happy to see him. And he runs to give him a big hug. Oh, what joy he had. His son was coming back home. The son said, Father, I am so sorry. Let me be one of your servants. I don't deserve to be your son anymore. But the father said to his servants, bring out a splendid robe for my son for, and uh, bring him some shoes for his feet, some sandals. Oh, my son is back home. 
The father went on, get a fat calf ready to make a feast. I thought my son was dead and I, that I'd never see him again. But look, he's alive and let's celebrate. I am so happy he's alive. When the elder son saw all the preparations going on, he was angry. He says, this is not fair. He said to his father, I've been here with you all the time and you've never made such a fuss over me and I've stayed with you the whole time working for you. He said, it's not fair. It's true, his father said, you have stayed here with me and I love you very much and you can have anything that you want that I can give you. But because your brother was lost and he's found, I found him again, I have to be especially glad. Oh, please be glad with me. You can see him talking to his son here. Many friends and family came to the feast. They were so happy musicians and everyone was rejoicing for his return. Now, God our Father is always happy when we return with our hearts, all our hearts for him. He loves you so much, and he loves all your family and me. Thank you, Jesus, for all you do for us. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 through 34. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, though I was an husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin, I will remember no more. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and the hearing of his word.
Psalm TV is a worldwide Christian ministry providing Christ-centered programs with clarity and power on topics such as Bible prophecy, end-time events, Bible interpretation, tips for helpful living, cooking demonstrations, and much more. Our programs provide practical counsel for daily life and assurance in these uncertain times. Download the free Sum TV app or watch online at sumtv.org. You will be blessed. The title of our study today is The Barabbas Connection. Before we begin, however, we want to have a word of prayer. Please bow your heads with me as we pray. Father in heaven, we come before your throne with humility, realizing that uh, you are so much wiser than we are. Instruct us today through the study of your word and give us the power to live in harmony with your will. We thank you, Lord, that we're able to live in this period of earth's history, a very trying period, very challenging, but also very rewarding. We ask that you will be with us, keep us faithful. We pray in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. When Jesus came to this world, his professed people were in a state of deep apostasy. And Jesus came to this earth to attempt to wake them up by proclaiming a loud cry, calling them to repentance and to a change of their behavior. It's interesting to notice that the people that Jesus came to save were not too excited about his message, particularly the religious leaders. In fact, the greatest controversies that Jesus had with the religious leaders of his day was over the Sabbath. The Sabbath of the rabbis was not the Sabbath of the Lord. It was a counterfeit Sabbath that they had created. It pointed to their authority instead of pointing to the authority of God. They kept the Sabbath in the wrong way, and therefore they were keeping a counterfeit Sabbath full of rules and regulations created by human beings. In John chapter 11, verses 49 and 50, we find a special meaning of the Sanhedrin that was called by the high priest of that year, Caiaphas. They were going to deal with the growing menace of Jesus Christ, at least menace in their view. When Jesus resurrected Lazarus, the multitudes began following Jesus, and they were forsaking the religious leaders and the synagogues. And so the Sanhedrin meant to decide what they were going to do with Jesus. Eventually they decided in this meeting that the only way to save the nation would be to kill Jesus. Let's read John 11, 49 and 50. And one of them, Caiaphas, being high priest that year, said to them, that is to the other members of the Sanhedrin, you know nothing at all, nor do you consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and not that the whole nation should perish? For the Sanhedrin, it was a matter of national security. And so that very day, the Sanhedrin plotted to put Jesus to death. We find that in John chapter 11 and verse 53, where we are told at the conclusion of the meeting of the Sanhedrin, the following words. Then from that day on, they plotted to put him to death. And so we find that the temple guard arrested Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane and they took him to Pilate. You see, the Jewish, the Jewish church was a religious organization. It did not have the power of the state to execute the death penalty. In other words, to condemn Jesus to death, they needed the aid of the civil power. We find in Matthew 27, verses 1 and 2, how the state now becomes involved in the experience of Christ. It says there, When morning came, 
all the chief priests and elders of the people plotted against Jesus to put him to death. And when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. So notice that not only is the church involved now, but the state is involved. The church wants the state to do its bidding in eliminating Christ, whom they felt to be a national security matter. Contrary to the aspirations of the Jewish leaders, Jesus refused to take the reins of civil power into his hands. In fact, Jesus rejected the idea that he was to be the ruler, the civil ruler on earth. In John 18, verse 36, we find uh, the experience of Jesus before Pontius Pilate. And Pilate asks Jesus, are you a king? Because the Jews have accused Jesus of sedition against the Roman government by claiming to be a king. Let's notice the answer of Jesus in John 18, 36. Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight, so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. The Jews accused Jesus of sedition against the Roman government. Jesus said, I do not claim to take the reins of civil power of Rome. I am no threat to Rome. The Jewish leaders accused Jesus of sedition against the Roman government, claiming that he called himself a king. Jesus, however, was no danger to the state of Rome. The Jews, however, made it appear that Jesus was a danger to the Roman state. Barabbas, whom we will talk a little bit more about as we move along, epitomized the desires of the Jews to take over the reins of the state or the reins of civil power. Barabbas wanted to introduce a new order of things. In fact, he was guilty of sedition. The Jews had the very sentiments that Barabbas had. They were seditionists against the government of Rome. The Jews, in other words, had the sentiments that Barabbas the criminal had. Let's read Mark chapter 15 and verse 7 in the King James Version where we're told that it was the intention of Barabbas to cause an insurrection against the Roman power. It says there, And there was one named Barabbas, which lay bound with them, that had made insurrection with him, who had com committed murder in the insurrection. This was an insurrection against the Roman government. Actually, he and his cohorts wanted to overthrow the Roman government so that the Jews could have absolute rule. Ellen White had an interesting description of Barabbas. In Desire of Ages, page 733, she wrote, The Roman authorities at this time held a prisoner named Barabbas, who was under sentence of death. This man had claimed to be the Messiah. He claimed authority to establish a different order of things, to set the world right. Under satanic delusion, he claimed that whatever he could obtain by theft and robbery was his own. He had done wonderful things through satanic agencies. He had gained a following among the people and had excited, listen carefully, sedition against the Roman government. Under cover of religious enthusiasm, he was a hardened and desperate villain bent on rebellion and cruelty. By giving the people a choice between this man and the innocent Savior, Pilate thought to arouse them to a sense of justice. He hoped to gain their sympathy for Jesus in opposition to the priests and rulers. So, turning to the crowd, he said with great earnestness, Whom will ye that I release unto you? 
Barabbas or Jesus, which is called Christ. So here Jesus and Barabbas are side by side. And Pilate says to the religious leaders and the multitudes that are influenced by them, Who do you want me to release, Barabbas the seditionist and the criminal, or Jesus Christ the innocent one who is not king of this world, who has come to bring mercy and peace in the stage of his rulership as king of the kingdom of grace? It's interesting to notice that it was the religious leaders who influenced the multitudes to clamor for uh, Pilate to release Barabbas instead of Jesus, the seditionist instead of Christ. In Matthew chapter 27 and verse 20, we find these words about the influence of the religious leaders upon the populace. It says there, But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitudes that they should ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. Notice the chief priests and the elders. The leaders of the apostate church are trying to influence the state to release the criminal, the seditionist, and to condemn he who is a law keeper and he who is innocent. John chapter 18 and verse 40 tells us that the multitudes under the influence of the religious leaders, chose Barabbas as the one to be released. It says there in John 18 and verse 40, Then they all cried again, saying, Not this man, in other words, not Jesus, but Barabbas. And then we have this side note, Now Barabbas was a robber. So here was Jesus, innocent, righteous, Law abiding. On the other hand, we have Barabbas, guilty, unrighteous, seditionist, lawbreaker. The Jews chose the lawbreaker and condemned the law keeper. They hated the one who kept the law and they loved the one who broke the law. Now it's interesting to notice that there were many denominations or religious sects in the days of Christ. And they all despised one another because they were competing for subjects. However, when it came to destroying what they perceived to be enemy number one, when they perceived that it was necessary to get rid of Jesus because he was a threat to national security, they all came together in unity. Notice what we find in um, John chapter 19 and verse 12. This is very, very interesting. This is speaking about Pilate. Pilate is out there in front of the multitudes, in front of the religious leaders, and he says to them, Who do you want me to release? And they say, Release Barabbas. And of course, Pilate doesn't want to release Barabbas. He wants to release Jesus Christ, the one who is a law keeper, the one who is innocent. And yet the Bible tells us that Pilate ultimately delivered to death a man that three times he proclaimed in public to be innocent. Why did Pilate deliver an innocent man? Folks, it was because he wanted to save his political position, his political skin, if you please. John 19 verse 12 tells us, From then on, Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, saying, If you let this man go, you are not Caesar's friend. Whoever makes himself a king speaks against Caesar. So they're saying to Pilate, If you release this man, we're going to tell uh, Caesar, that this man claimed to be a king and that you let him loose and that he's a threat to the authority of the Roman Empire. Now let's move to the end time. What we've studied so far is really symbolic of what's going to happen at the end of time with God's people. As it was in the days of Christ, so will it be at the end. What happened to the head of the church at that time is going to happen to his church at the end of time. Here we apply the principle of Saul of Tarsus. 
You remember he was on his way to Damascus to arrest the Christians and take them bound to Jerusalem. And as he is nearing Damascus, he hears a voice that says, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Well, Saul wasn't persecuting Jesus in person. Saul was persecuting the church, and the church is the body of Christ. So by persecuting the church, Saul of Tarsus was actually persecuting the head, Jesus Christ. Notice John chapter 16, verses 1 to 3, where we are told that God's people would go through the same experience as Christ. It says in John 16, 1 verse 3, here Jesus is speaking, These things I have spoken to you, that you should not be made to stumble. They will put you out of the synagogues. At the end time, we would call them churches. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think he offers God service. This must be apostate uh, individuals because it says that they are people who believe in God. They think that by killing the apostles and by killing God's people at the end of time, they are rendering God a service. And then Jesus says, and these things they do to you because they have not known the Father nor me. The Christian world professed to be God's chosen people today, but to a great degree the Christian world is in a deep state of apostasy. Jesus, through his chosen people, will come to the world with a final loud cry calling the world to repentance and pleading with them to change their wicked ways. At the end, the religious world will also enforce a Sabbath created by human beings. You say, how is that? Well, the Bible says that the seventh day is the Sabbath. The Christian world in its majority says that Sunday is the day that we're supposed to keep. You see, Sabbath is the day that God has established. Sunday is a day of rest created by man. The only difference between the Sabbath and the days of Christ and the Sabbath at the end of time is that in the times of Christ, the Jews kept the Sabbath in the wrong way, in a way in which had been created by man. At the end of time, the apostasy will be keeping the wrong day. Let's go to John chapter 11, verses 49 and 50. Here we find that the argument of Caiaphas, this man must die so that we can save the nation in this time of national emergency, the argument will be used once again. I'm reading now from... Um, John 11, verses 49 and 50, which we already referred to. Let's go to John 11, verses 49 and 50. It says there, And then one of them, Caiaphas, being high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you consider that, all, that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and not that the whole nation should perish? Do you know that that argument is going to be used again against God's people at the end of time? Notice this statement from Great Controversy 615 and 616. It will be urged that the few who stand in opposition to an institution of the church and a law of the state, this is the Sunday law, ought not to be tolerated, that it is better for them to suffer than whole nations to be thrown into confusion and lawlessness. The same argument, notice the same argument, many centuries ago was brought against Christ by the rulers of the people. It is, it is expedient for us, said the wily Caiaphas, that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation perish not. This argument will appear conclusive and a decree will finally be issued against those who hallow the Sabbath of the fourth commandment denouncing them as deserving of the severest punishment and giving the people liberty after a certain time to put them to death. Romanism in the old world and apostate Protestantism in the new will pursue a similar course toward those who honor all the divine precepts. 
in the days of Christ, the religious leaders despised Jesus for the way that He kept the Sabbath. At the end of time, the religious world will despise God's faithful remnant because of the day that they keep, the day that the Bible commands. The religious leaders, we remember, then pronounced the death sentence upon Jesus. However, they had a problem. The church as a church could not execute the death penalty. They needed the help of the state. And so, at the end of time, the religions of the world, the religious systems, Protestantism and apostate, uh, uh, the apostate papacy are going to do the same, link up with the state to persecute God's faithful people and proclaim a death sentence. Notice this statement from the book Great Controversy. The clergy will put forth almost superhuman efforts to shut away the light lest it should shine upon their flocks. By every means at their command, they will endeavor to suppress the discussion of these vital questions, and that is questions regarding the Sabbath. Notice this. The church appeals to the strong arm of civil power, just like the apostate Jewish church appealed to the Roman state. Once again, the church appeals to the strong arm of civil power, and in this work, Papists and Protestants unite. As the movement for Sunday enforcement becomes more bold and decided, the law will be invoked against commandment keepers. Now here's the irony. Jesus refused to take over the reins of civil power, saying that His kingdom was not of this world. And yet the Jewish leaders accused Jesus of sedition against the Roman government because He had called Himself a king. God's people at the end of time will represent no power for the civil powers, no danger rather for the civil powers of the world. But it will be made to appear like they're enemies of the civil power, just as happened with Jesus. In the book Great Controversy, page 592, we find this amazing statement about God's people in the end time. Those who honor the Bible Sabbath will be denounced as enemies of law and order, as breaking down the moral restraints of society, causing anarchy and corruption, and calling down the judgments of God upon the earth. Their conscientious scruples will be pronounced obstinacy, stubbornness, and contempt of authority. They will be accused, listen carefully now, they will be accused of disaffection toward the government, Ministers, now who's behind all of this, ministers who deny the obligation of the divine law will present from the pulpit the duty of yielding obedience to the civil authorities as ordained of God. In legislative halls and courts of justice, commandment keepers will be misrepresented and condemned. A false coloring will be given to their words. The worst construction will be put upon their motives. Barabbas epitomized the desires of the Jewish leaders to take over the reins of civil power and bring in a new order of things. Barabbas was guilty of sedition. The Jews had the very sentiments that Barabbas had. They were seditionists against the Roman government. They wanted to take control of the civil power and to impose their religious observances by the force of law. Incidentally, the Jewish nation, the apostate Jewish nation, actually were guilty of spiritual fornication, because instead of accepting Jesus Christ as their king, they actually claimed that Caesar was their king. Notice John chapter 19, and verse 15, John 19, verse 15. But they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. At that moment, they were committing fornication. They were saying, Our king is the civil power, not Jesus Christ who was king of the spiritual kingdom. They asked for Barabbas 
instead of asking for the release of Jesus. At the end, the same decision will be made. Here are God's people, innocent, righteous, law-abiding. On the other hand, there will be the religious world, guilty, unrighteous, lawbreakers. The Jews chose the lawbreaker and condemned the lawkeeper. They hated the one who kept the law and loved the one who broke it. So it will be also at the end. Now let's continue our study uh, uh, that we're tracing regarding this. Do you remember that the populace was actually influenced by the religious leaders? We read that in Matthew chapter 27 and verse 20. At the end of time, once again, the religious leaders will influence their churches to persecute those who are faithful to God. Great Controversy 445, when the leading churches of the United States, uniting upon such points of doctrine as are held by them in common, see all the unity of the churches, uh, setting aside their differences, just like in the days of Christ. So once again, when the leading churches of the United States uniting upon such points of doctrine as are held by them in common, shall influence the state to enforce their decrees and to sustain their institutions, then Protestant America will have formed an image of the Roman hierarchy and the infliction of civil penalties upon dissenters will inevitably, inevitably result. Now, remember that Pilate actually delivered Jesus, who was innocent, in order to save his political position, the same is going to happen at the end of time. Notice this statement in volume 5 of the Testimonies, pages 450 and 451. Persecuting rulers, ministers, and church members will conspire against them, that is against God's people, with voice and pen, by boasts, threats, and ridicule, they will seek to overthrow their faith. By false representations and angry appeals, they will stir up the passions of the people. Notice who's doing this, rulers, ministers, and church members. They will stir up the passions of the people, not having a thus saith the scriptures to bring against the advocates of the Bible Sabbath, they will resort to oppressive enactments to supply the lack. Now notice this, to secure popularity and patronage, that is votes, by the way, folks, legislators will yield, just like Pilate yielded, will yield to the demand for a Sunday law. As the Jews rejected the gospel of Christ, the Christian world will reject the law of Christ. The Jews accepted the law and rejected the gospel. On the other hand, the Christian world claims to have accepted the, accepted the gospel and yet rejects the law saying that it was nailed to the cross. Both groups, the Jews of Christ's day as well as the Christian world at the end of time are rejecting Jesus Christ because the law is a transcript of the character of Jesus Christ. How can you say, I love Jesus Christ, but I... I don't like the reflection of the character of Jesus Christ as found in the written law. The law is embodied in the person of Jesus Christ. At the end of time, the character of Christ embodied in His people will lead the Christian world to crucify, so to speak, the remnant. Ellen White wrote, wrote these very... Uh, interesting words in Testimonies to Ministers, page 132. She says, Today men are choosing Barabbas and saying, Crucify Christ. You said, now wait a minute, Barabbas and Christ, Christ was in heaven, Barabbas was dead. How can Ellen White say, Today men are choosing Barabbas and saying, Crucify Christ? Notice the answer. They will do this in the person of the saints. They will go over the same ground, notice the same ground as the Jewish priests and rulers did in their treatment of Christ. He, the Son of God, and an innocent man was murdered because he told men truths 
that it did not please them to hear. Yet he was the son of the infinite God. Those who today despise the law of Jehovah, showing no respect for his commandments, are taking sides with the great apostate. They proclaim to a sin-corrupted world that the law of God is null and void. Those who declare this as truth deceive the people and have virtually nailed the law of Jehovah to the cross between two thieves. What a thought. In Great Controversy, page 22, Ellen White uh, compared the sin of the Jews in the days of Christ and the sin of the Christian world at the end of time. And it appears to be two different sins. Notice Great Controversy, page 22. The great sin of the Jews was their rejection of Christ. Rejection of Christ. The great sin of the Christian world would be their rejection of the law of God the foundation of his government in heaven and in earth. So the Jews rejected Christ, the Christian world rejects the law saying that it was nailed to the cross. This is the same sin. You say, how is that? Well, notice this statement in volume 5 of the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary. It was written by Ellen White, page 1131. This is a key statement. Jesus is the embodiment of the law of God which is the transcript of his character. What does embodiment mean? Here's a dictionary definition. The embodiment is the representation or expression of something in a tangible or, viv or visible form. So in other words, the principles of God's law are embodied in Jesus. He's a living case example of the law lived out in a body in human form. You see, the Jews claim to accept the reflection of Christ's character, which is the law, whereas they rejected the original Jesus Christ. On the other hand, Christians will reject the reflection of Christ in His law while they claim at the same time to accept Christ, the original. It is impossible to love Christ and to hate His law because the law is a reflection of who Jesus is. Jesus was the law in living color, if you please. The Bible tells us in Psalm 40, verses 6 through 8, speaking about Jesus, the Messiah, you have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. Ellen White described the hatred of Jesus towards sin or the transgression of the law. In Selected Messages, Volume 1, page 254, she wrote, Never before had there been a being upon the earth who hated sin with so perfect a hatred as did Christ. He had seen its deceiving, infatuating power upon the holy angels, and all his powers were enlisted against it. And that's why Satan's power was enlisted against Christ. And Satan, working through the religious leaders, were actually opposed to Christ because Christ was the embodiment of the law, and Satan hates the law because he loves sin. God's people at the end of time will hate sin and they will live the law. And therefore the lawbreakers will hate God's people who reflect the principles of God's law in their lives. In Great Controversy, page 571 and 572, Ellen White indicted Protestantism. She wrote, As the Protestant churches have been seeking the favor of the world, false charity, false love, has blinded their eyes. They do not see but that it is right to believe good of all evil. And as the inevitable result, they will finally believe evil of all good. Instead of standing in defense of the faith, once delivered to the saints, they are now, as it were, apologizing to Rome, that is to the papacy, for their uncharitable opinion of her, begging pardon for their bigotry. And so because Protestantism rejects the law of God, saying it was nailed to the cross, we're not under law, we're under grace, we don't have to keep the law, Jesus kept the law for us, because that's their attitude, Ellen White states that they will finally believe evil of all good because they believe good 
of all evil. God wants to take His law and He wants to write that law in our minds and in our hearts. He does not want the law to remain on tables of stone. He wants to take the law, the principles of the Ten Commandments, and He wants to write them in our minds and in our hearts so that we will embody the principles of the Ten Commandments, so that we will be, be a living reflection of the principles that we find in the law of God. But before this, God has to change our heart. In Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 26 and 27, we find a promise, a beautiful promise of God if we will consent. This is what it says. God is speaking. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. Notice here we have two things. God promises to write the law in the heart after He's taken out the heart of stone and given a heart of flesh. And then it says that God will cause His people to walk in His statutes and to keep His judgments to do them. Why are they doing them? Because God commands it? No. It's because the law is written in their hearts and they do what the law requires by nature, if you please. Jeremiah 31 verses 31 to 34 has this beautiful promise about the new covenant. You know, some people say the old covenant was law, the new covenant is grace. The Jews had to keep the law and they were saved by keeping the law. We're saved by grace. We don't have to keep the law. Jesus kept it in our place. Well, what changes in the two covenants is not the law. What changes is the place where the law is written. It's not written in ta on tables of stone. It should be written in the heart. Notice Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. That's the covenant formula. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother saying, Know the Lord, for they all shall know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. The book of Hebrews makes this promise for Christians. God wants to take His law that is written on tables of stone and he wants, it to, uh, he wants to embody it in us so that we will live out the principles of the law because it's in our minds and in our hearts. At the very end, the Christian world will crucify the law and therefore they will want to crucify those who reflect the law of God. In the times of Christ, they wanted to crucify Christ because His character revealed the law. There's a time of trouble coming upon this world according to the Bible. You can read Matthew chapter 24 and verse 21, Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1, among many other verses. During this time, God's faithful people like Jesus will feel forsaken. They will think that perhaps even God has forsaken them, but as Jesus, who had nothing to lean upon, even He said to His Father, Why have you forsaken me? Jesus trusted in His Father, although He could not see Him, He could not feel Him, because He had an experience with His Father before. He knew that even though He couldn't feel His Father, His Father was there. Ellen White described the condition of this world at the end of time when God's Spirit is withdrawn from the world. In the Review and Herald, April 14, 1896, she wrote, this is a chilling statement. I get goosebumps when I read it. The forces of darkness will unite with human agents who have given themselves into the control of Satan. And now listen carefully. And the same scenes that were exhibited at the trial, rejection, and crucifixion of Christ will be revived. 
the experience of Jesus when the church appealed to the arm of the state to persecute Christ and lead to His death will be the same spirit of the Christian world at the end of time. The statement continues, through yielding to satanic influences, men will be transformed into fiends. A fiend is a demon, by the way. She continues, and those who were created in the image of God, who were formed to honor and glorify their Creator, will become the habitation of dragons. In other words, Satan will totally possess the religious world who did not become allied to Christ before the close of probation. And now notice this chilling part of the statement. I go back just a little bit. Those who were formed to honor and glorify their Creator will become the habitation of dragons, and Satan will see in an apostate race his masterpiece of evil, men who reflect his own image. What a chilling statement. But on the other hand will be God's people. Notice Christ's object lessons, page 69. This is a very well-known statement. Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of Himself in His church. When the character of Christ, what is the character of Christ? It is the law of God lived in the human body, lived by the human person so that people can see the principles of the law of God lived out. Once again, when the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in His people, then He will come to claim them as His own. This is the second coming of Christ. When the character of Christ is perfectly reproduced in His people, you know, during the time of trouble, there will be two groups that reflect an image. The wicked will reflect fully and perfectly the image of Satan. The righteous will reflect perfectly the image of Christ. That will be the nature of the final battle. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17 explains what the final issues will be. It says there in this very well-known verse, and the dragon, that's Satan by the way, was wroth. That means that he's going to be very angry. The dragon was wroth with the woman. The woman represents the church, God's end time remnant, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. So what is the dragon going to do? He's going to war against the remnant of the woman's seed. What is the characteristic of this group? Well, actually they have two, which keep what? The commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. What are the two things that the dragon especially is enraged about that characterize the remnant of the woman? It is the fact that they keep the commandments of God that fills Satan with rage because they are revealing that it is possible to overcome in Christ. And they have the testimony of Jesus, which we know to be the spirit of prophecy, a prophet in our midst, teaching us the principles of the Bible, amplifying them, and correcting us when we go astray. By choosing Barabbas and crucifying Jesus, the Jews expected, the religious leaders especially, expected to save their nation from doom. But in condemning Jesus to death, they caused what they wished to prevent. Because national apostasy resulted in national ruin. The same is going to happen at the end of time with this marvelous country that we live in, the United States of America, and we can already see the beginnings of this. I read one final statement in closing. Signs of the Times, July 4, 1889. The greatest and most favored nation upon the earth is the United States. A gracious providence has shielded this country and poured upon her the choicest of heaven's blessings. Here the persecuted and oppressed have found refuge because they fled from Europe here seeking religious liberty. She continues, here the Christian faith in its purity has been taught. This people have been the recipients of great light and unrivaled mercies. But what has happened with the United States? What have they done with the great light and unrivaled mercies that God has poured out upon this nation? 
You look at the Christian world today, they watch what everybody else watches, they eat what everybody else eats, they dress like the world, they watch the same television programs and movies as the world. What has happened to the Christian world? Ellen White then describes what ha has happened to the United States which has received great light and unrivaled mercies. But these gifts have been repaid by ingratitude and forgetfulness of God. The Infinite One keeps a reckoning with the nations, and their guilt is proportioned to the light rejected. A fearful record now stands in the register of heaven against our land, but the crime which shall fill up the measure of her iniquity is that of making void the law of God, and I would add, not only making void, void the law of God, but persecuting those who keep the commandments of God, especially the Seventh-day Sabbath, which the Bible commands, which the religious world says, no, that was for the Jews. Sunday is now our day of worship. So we will repeat the history that took place in the time of Christ. May God help us to be on His side, to love His law and reflect it in our lives. Our song, Jesus is All the World to Me. So we pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the lessons that we have learned today from your holy word. 
we ask that you will take those lessons and write them in our minds and in our hearts, that we might do your will, not out of compulsion, but because we love you. We know that there are turbulent times ahead, but we also know that if we are close to you and have an intimate relationship with you, we have nothing absolutely to fear. So take these lessons, write them in our minds and in our hearts. We pray in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.